Hey guys, welcome to Storytime with Jester. Tonight I'll be picking up where we left off last time in the Book of Prophecies. Chapter 81. Griffin, Red, and Zephelin entered the vast chamber accompanied by two dwarven clerics. A structure similar to a ziggurat dominated the place, standing some 120 feet high. At the top stood two dozen figures wearing silver robes trimmed in black and clerical vestments of red and gold embroidered with runes. They all wore large masks of goat heads, and the leader carried a staff capped by the skull of a goat. <clears throat> They all stood chanting in a circle around a pool of mercury. Standing near the leader was a grotesque-looking demon with the body of an ape and a head of a boar. Its small wings fluttered as it watched the ceremony in anticipation. Another of its kind was flying around the chamber, as were several demons that resembled giant vultures. At the bottom of the only flight of stairs that led to the uppermost tier was a demon with the upper torso of a female with six arms and the bottom of a serpent. It wielded bladed weapons in each hand. I wish Pantera were here right about now, Red said. As do I, agreed Griffin. Let us hope our gnome friends win the day, or we will soon have even more to deal with. Aye, one of the dwarves added. This be enough right here. Enough talk, the other dwarf said, and, and threw his warhammer at the nearest demon. Since going on the mission that Varag had sent them, both Griffin and Red had succumbed to the powers of the Queen of Succubi. As a result, they now wore her colors of purple and red. Red's favored weapon now was a magical scourge. It was this weapon he bore against the demons. Griffin alternated between shooting at the serpent demon and swapping friends and foes at opportune times. The second dwarf also attacked with his hammer, his being a return thrower as his kinsman. Griffin's arrows just bounced off of the serpent demon, who seemed content to let the vulture demons take on the intruders as she stood her post at the steps. After getting hit with the dwarven hammers, the two vulture demons were prepared the next time, using their telekinesis ability to suspend the hammers in the air as they were en route to them. They then used that same power to propel the hammers at Griffin and Red while they swooped in to attack the hammerless dwarves. <coughs> Griffin dodged the hammer hurled at him, and seeing the dire straits the dwarves were in, quickly used his own power to swap the dwarves with two of the priests on the top tier. As a result, the vulture demons ended up rending the priests with their sharp talons, while the dwarves' sudden appearance amongst the chanting circle of priests caused a momentary pause in the summoning ritual. The demon, protecting the leader, seeing the two dwarves so close to his charge, stood there motionless his eyes glowing red as he concentrated on his favorite mode of attack. The dwarves, not used to Griffin's unique abilities, were unprepared for the sudden change of their whereabouts and therefore did not take advantage of the demon's apparent inaction. This gave the demon the time he needed to unleash his attack. A fan of multicolored rays shot forth from his fingertips. In the blink of an eye, the dwarves were gone, and in their place stood two surprised priests who took the full brunt of the demon's attack. Priests immediately stopped chanting and began to wander around as if in a trance. The other ape demon, who up till now was surveying the battlefield from above, correctly surmised the cause of the sudden swapping of combatants. He created several false images of himself and dove down to strike Griffin. Red was relishing the damage he was causing the two demons that had ganged up on him. Since being briefly stunned by the dwarf's hammer, he waded into the fray with sadistic glee causing the barbs of his scourge to tear flesh and feathers from his demonic opponents. The demons were, were not without their own fighting prowess. In fact, they were experts. They withheld their deadly spore attack, knowing Red's armor would most likely protect him, and went straight to full-on melee, viciously ripping into him with claws and beak. The sheer strength of these creatures from the abyss pos possessed... The sheer strength that these creatures from the abyss possessed allowed their talons to sunder his armor while they thrust their beaks into exposed flesh like a plunging dagger. The dwarves, back on the main floor, were able to retrieve their hammers and join the battle again. 
they rushed the two vulture demons while hurling their hammers at the two that were brutalizing Red. The hammers slammed into their targets, creating enough pause in Red's assailants for him to recover and press on his attack once again. Their hammers returned to them in time to use them to full advantage on the demons they were charging. On the upper tier, the remaining two score priests continued chanting. A faint image began to materialize above and from the pool of mercury, taking shape of an enormous beast with the head of a goat and giant bat wings. Its lower extremities were consumed in flame as if it were emerging from the depths of hell itself. Griffin's attention was drawn to this, and as a result never saw the ape demon bearing down on him. The demon slammed into Griffin with all the weight of his lumbering body. Griffin sprawled onto the floor, stunned, while the demon prepared his signature attack. With everyone else preoccupied with their own demons, Griffin lay there motionless as he was engulfed in multicolored rays. His body trembled with fear as his mind portrayed images of unimaginable horror. The demon stood over Griffin, absorbing his fear as if feasting on a meal. The two dwarves, brave as anyone could be, were no match one-on-one -on -one against the elite techniques of the vulture demons. Within minutes, their mangled bodies lay on the temple's floor, their killers moving on to aid in the slaughter of Red. Griffin, cowering in his own mind, was not able to aid his friend. By the time he was released from the grip of mental torture, Red lay on the floor in a bloody heap. The last thing Griffin saw before he slipped into unconsciousness was the vulture demons ripping in two Red and eating the flesh of his best friend. Chapter 82 <clears throat> Zephelin used his magical floppy hat to disguise himself as one of the gray dwarves in the temple complex. He then used a spell to become invisible and for good measure activated the power of his ring to blend into the nearby stone wall. He then ate a mushroom that had the power to heal. When his group had entered the temple proper, he knew he was not staying around for certain death, so he slipped out undetected and headed for an exit. However, his greed delayed his escape as he was drawn back into a chamber they had traveled through on their way to the temple. A room, or rather what was in the room, which could not escape his thoughts since he laid eyes on it. He needed to regain his spells if he was going to achieve his goals, so he found a quiet corner of an empty room, curled up, and went to sleep. When he awoke just over eight hours later, he studied his spell book, memorizing what spells he would need for the tasks at hand and of his eventual escape. After stealthily moving from room to room, sometimes tiptoeing around passed out dwarfs from the last revelry, he finally came upon his prize. In the center of an enormous thoroughfare chamber stood a gigantic statue of the Prince of, Un of the Undead. It wasn't the statue itself he was interested in, it was the massive rubies that were the eyes of the statue. They were the largest gems he had ever seen before in his entire life. In his wildest dreams, he couldn't have even fathomed gems of this size. Since seeing them, he had thought of nothing else but how he was going to take them. Now that he was here, he knew what he must do. He spread his magical net out on the floor as if he meant to lay a trap for someone. He tied a rope to it and around his waist. Then he cast a spell on himself, giving him the ability to climb like a spider, which he used to scale the statue. Using his dagger and a pry bar, he carefully pried each of the eyes out of the sockets of the statue. After the first, he let it drop and commanded the net to enclose while pulling up on the rope so the gem wouldn't hit the floor. He then gently lowered the net back down and commanded it to open. He repeated this process with the second gem, then climbed down the statue and retrieved the gems, storing the net and rope in their proper places. The gems were much too bulky to carry, so he cast a variation of a spell that created a tiny hut and rolled the gems into it. Then he ended the spell, trapping the gems in a pocket dimension. His next challenge was to get safely out. He was fortunate that his artful thievery took place during the time the dwarves slept off their ale, which they consumed in large quantities. However, not knowing when they would wake up, he acted quickly. Using his wand to detect secret doors, he made his way through the guards, some sleeping, some not. The ones not, he defeated using his illusions to create fireballs, backstabbing those that didn't succumb to his guile. Finally, he located the exit and made his good his escape, leaving the fate of the rest of his group to themselves, for he cared not. Chapter 83 Like Sandro, Bree, Grace, and Callie had finished their journey and were almost at the capital of the county of Rurik, where they called home. 
It had been nearly a year since they left the capital, and they were eager to get back to some semblance of a routine. As they passed through a small village, they noticed off in the distance what looked like a large army marching to war. Banners flapping in the breeze, the soldiers marched north towards the theocracy of Ruse. The four rode up to the village's only inn, dismounted, and went inside. The inn was abuzz with conversation from what seemed like the entire population of the village. Black Sandro went to the bartender to ask what was happening. Are we at war with Ruse? he asked. Ruse? Their god has forsaken them. They are no more, the bartender replied. What do you mean, no more? Destroyed. Gone. Wiped out. By who? How? The army of the dead, a patron interjected. They march on us as we speak. Aye, the bartender confirmed. The armies of Rurik and Vanik go out to meet them. <clears throat> I hear another undead army overran Crane, another patron chimed in. Came down from the platinum mines. Nothing much to stand in their way there, what with the condition of the duchy as of late. Yet a third patron leaned in a little, as if what he was about to say was a secret. I hear people done gone missing in Pelandava, too. Taken in the middle of the night, they were. This be the witch queen's doing. Black Sandro stood there, stunned at all he had been hearing. Ruse and Crane destroyed? Why, he and the three priestesses he had just had just spent time in each. To think, had they delayed in either, or chose a different route back home, they might have gotten caught in all of it as well. Praise be to the Lord of Light for protecting them. He must make haste to the capital. His superiors, in the order of knights he belongs, will know what to do. He left the trestle as a group of patrons argued about who it was that was responsible for the sea of undead. He shoved aside the throng of people barring his way to the priestesses and led them outside. We leave for the capital at once, he said. Our Lord's light is needed now more than ever. With that, they mounted their horses and sped off towards the capital and away from the army of the dead. Doomsday, Chapter 84 the little red-skinned demon-like creature watched its mistress with gleeful anticipation as she attempted to awaken her son from the deep sleep he placed him in some three years ago. The raven-haired woman hovered over the vampire corpse lying in its coffin as if she were going to drink its undeath. She spread her arms over his body and wide about her, dispelling the illusion identical to the one she had placed on his brother nearly a quarter century before. She followed with another dispel magic spell, releasing him from his slumber. <clears throat> what sat up in the coffin was a hideous distortion of what once was. What started out as Pedius and later as Pantera was no longer human. A priest of Brugel had been the first to his fallen body in Crane, and had taken him to a sudden location. Had, had taken him to a hidden location nearby, where the priest enacted the horrific ritual that would alter his natural form to what it was now. His visage was akin to that of a lich, with small fiery dots for eyes which seemed to burn through all that he gazed at. He wore blackened armor and clothing, as if he had been on fire and the flames snuffed out just prior to conflagration. With a cold reverence, the raven-haired woman looked up, looked upon the creature that was her son and said but one thing, it is time. And that, my friends, is where we will end tonight's reading. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed reading it to you. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and notification bells, and share with all of your friends. Um, make sure you... Um, what else is it that I need you to make sure you do? Uh, I can't remember right now. So I'll just leave it at until next time. And as always, see you soon.